Hold on. Hold on until the tanks relieve you. Hold on without reinforcement or resupply. Hold on until victory. Except there won't be a victory. This battle is lost. It was lost days ago. You're just holding on until someone decides to get you out. Such was the fate of the British powers at Oosterbeek. Last time we saw the Poles drop at Driel and caused the Germans to shift their focus south of Arnhem. The corridor was cut at Wegel and the British attacks in the north stalled. The Germans at Oosterbeek pounded the British powers whilst the Red Devils held on inside the Witch's Cauldron. This time we're going to cover the last few days of Operation Market Garden, starting from the 23rd of September and ending on the 26th. You'll be surprised to learn that the remaining airborne reinforcements flew in on the 23rd of September. Yes! Seven days after the beginning of the operation, the Poles received the rest of their brigade that hadn't taken it off two days previously. The 101st and the 82nd also received additional reinforcements, including an entire regiment, the 325th Glider Infantry, that landed at Nijmegen. With additional reinforcements, the Allies pushed Camp Group Walther back towards Gemert in the evening of the 23rd. Defeated it may have been, but Kanthgrupp Walther had cut Hell's Highway for 36 hours. Unfortunately, Walther was now in a poor position to attack the corridor once more, since British 8th Corps was now at Durin. Over the next couple of days, it would withdraw to Boxmere and would play no further part in the battle. On the 24th, however, Kanthgrupp Huber, on the other side of the Hell's Highway, attacks towards Vegel. This camp group was weaker than Walther, consisting of perhaps four Volksmega battalions, backed up by Jag Panther tank destroyers. But the Germans had done their reconnaissance. They'd found gaps in the American lines. Striking into Erd from Schindel, the German Jag Panthers annihilated British tanks supported by American paratroopers. Several Shermans were taken out, and trucks burst into flames on Hell's Highway itself. Now, whilst the Germans hadn't got onto the road, they had prevented traffic from flowing north. Once again, the corridor was cut. Worse, another force from Kampf Huber attacked towards Kuvering the next day. Ambushing vehicles on the road, Volkschmager did enough damage to cut the road again. 50 vehicles were destroyed and the road was blocked here until the 26th, day 10 of Operation Market Garden, and basically the end. On the 24th, day 8th of the operation, a meeting was held at Valberg between Horrocks, Browning, Thomas and Sosabowski to decide what to do. Sosabowski pointed out that sending reinforcements into Oosterbeek was pointless. A major crossing could not be mounted because 30 Corps was stretched too thin and had logistical troubles in the south. Instead, Horrocks decided that small crossings would continue for the time being. Interestingly, he told Sosabowski that if he didn't like the idea of small crossings, he would be relieved of his command. Yes, Horrocks was under pressure, but it may seem a little odd that Sosabowski was threatened with resignation. I'll go into more detail as to why there was a distrust of the Polish commander in the next and final episode of the series, but either way, on the 24th, more assault boats arrived and 300 men, mostly Poles, got into Oosterby. A lot were killed trying to make the crossing. With the corridor cut further south, 30 Corps struggled to press on towards Oosterbeek. On the evening of the 23rd, 130th Brigade finally reached the Poles at Driel, making this the first substantial connection 30 Corps had had with the forces fighting on the Rhine. They still fought the Germans at Elst and Bemmel and would take Arpensden by the 26th. Even with the 300 man reinforcement and the arrival at last of Allied fighter bombers from the 23rd onward, the situation in Oosterbeek during the last few days of the operation remained bleak. Despite being assaulted by tanks, grenades and a host of other weapons, including flamethrowers, specially requested by German commanders and ordered by Modal himself, somehow First Airborne continued to hold on. It was joked at the time that the British used German weapons since their ammunition had run out, and the Germans used British weapons since their logistics were strained and they were getting resupplied by the Allies via the air. And the Germans still didn't have enough troops to deliver a decisive blow on the cauldron. Worse, the troops that the Germans did have were suffering high casualties as they tried to storm each of the British strong points, since the defence of Oosterbeek was now a series of points rather than a continuous line. German commanders were angry that their troops were losing as many tanks as they were. The reason for the losses was because the German infantry weren't trained and were few in number, and because there was a shortage of radios amongst the Germans. British anti-tank guns and infantry managed to knock out numerous German vehicles, including Sturmgeschutz self-propelled guns, 
and even some Panther tanks. Surprisingly, the German Königstiger or King Tiger tanks weren't that effective at Oosterbeek, mainly due to the narrow terrain which took off their tracks and prevented their turrets from turning. This was a little comfort to the British who didn't realise that the Germans were reorganising their lines. The Germans pulled in all their veterans from the various camp group that surrounded the British pocket and put them on the eastern side. It was hoped that this reorganisation would enable the Germans to pierce the British perimeter and bring about the end of the British resistance. An attack was mounted on the afternoon of the 25th and actually penetrated the British line. Somehow, the British managed to stop the Germans, whose attack lost momentum quickly due to fierce resistance and a huge amount of British artillery. The British called in artillery and finally airstrikes on the Germans to stall the attacks, whilst the Germans used Nebelwerfer's rocket artillery to pound the British into submission. A lot of the British prisoners taken in these critical days were shell-shocked by these strikes. Water and medical supplies were all but gone and truces had to be called to evacuate the wounded to German hospitals in Arnhem. Thousands of British troops would end up as prisoners of war for this reason, perhaps as many as 6,000 at the end of the battle. Having hung on for nine days, the paras were finished. On the evening of the 25th, a plan to withdraw across the Rhine was put in place and the paratroopers crossed the Rhine in small boats throughout the night under the cover of artillery fire. By the early morning of the 26th, the evacuation was over and the survivors of 1st Airborne met at Driel. Just 1,741 men of 1st Airborne had made it to Allied lines. The rest of the 10,000 that had dropped into Arnhem were either killed, wounded or captured. In contrast, the Germans had lost around 3,000 men in the Arnhem sector. Another German attack went in on the 26th and found no resistance. The Germans were surprised. All they found were dead bodies and weapons. The British had gone. Yes, the field hospitals were full, but it dawned on them that the British had withdrawn overnight and they had succeeded. They defeated the British. They'd won. And thus ended Operation Market Garden. It was day 10 now after the battle had begun, and at best you could probably call it a draw, but really it was a defeat for the Allies. The British had failed to cross the Rhine, their ultimate objective, and although the Allied troops had fought heroically throughout the battle, they tried to go a bridge too far. Total losses for both sides vary depending on which source you use. It's safe to assume that the German losses were somewhere around six to 9,000 men, although the actual number may never be known. Allied losses may be as high as 17,000, with about half of them over 8,000 being first airborne alone. But this series isn't over yet. We have one more main episode to go, and it's a biggie. The question we're going to ask, and I'll ask you guys now, is who was to blame for the failure of Operation Market Garden? Comment below and let me know. We've seen what happened, we've watched the battle unfold, now we get to decide who should take the blame for this defeat. We will find out next time. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, bye for now.